Hello, RP clients. This is Dr. Jen Case with Renaissance Periodization. Today, I'm going to lead you through a basic overview of the diet templates. Please keep in mind while watching this that this is just kind of a general overview. Your plan may look slightly different based on your individual needs and any health considerations that went into designing your plan. If you look at the top of your spreadsheet, you'll see uh, different columns with listed foods for your lean proteins, your veggies, etc. These are not an all-inclusive list. It's just giving you some options, uh, recommendations of where to start. I recommend following the recommended foods for at least the first couple of weeks of using this new template. That way you can get a feel for what you're trying to get out of each of your meals. Once you're a little more comfortable with the diet, you can start looking for foods that are not on the template if there's something in particular you're missing out on in your diet. I'm going to go through kind of the assumed calories and macros associated with each of these columns so that when you are wanting to look for alternatives to what's on this list, you know what to keep in mind. If you look underneath of the logo, you'll see a hot link for additional information. That additional information is going to be all of the plan assumptions that I'm about to go over with you. So if you forget at any time what counts as a lean protein or what counts as a healthy fat, just click on that additional information tab and you'll be redirected to the plan assumptions so you can get a little refresher. Let's begin with lean proteins. For something to be considered a lean protein, it's going to have a ratio of 4 to 1. So 4 grams of protein to 1 gram of fat or less. Now if you want to eat something that has more fat than that, say you want to incorporate a sausage of some kind into your menu, the additional fats in that meat would need to count towards your healthy fats for that meal. If you look underneath of the recommended lean proteins, you'll see that there is a hot link for determining cooked amounts of protein. This link here is very handy if you do large batches of cooking, like say you only cook once or twice a week and then meal prep. This link here is really going to be beneficial for you. So let's click on that and see where it goes. So under that hot link of determining cooked protein, let's say that you cooked up a large amount of chicken breast. And when you weigh out your amount of cooked chicken breast, it comes out to 28 ounces. What we're going to do is enter that 28 ounces of cooked chicken breast into the yellow column. And we look and we see that 28 ounces of cooked chicken breast would have been roughly 42 ounces of raw chicken breasts. And the reason why we look at the raw weight is because that's how we determine the amount of protein that was present in that food. And when we say protein here, we're meaning the nutrient protein. So to figure out what you need to program into your meals, let's say the meal calls for 18 grams of protein. We look over here at the raw weight table. 18 grams of protein is equivalent to three ounces of uncooked meat. We had 42 ounces of uncooked chicken. So now we're gonna have a little bit of fun with math. We take those 42 ounces of uncooked chicken, divide it by the three ounces that is correlated to 18 grams of protein, and that tells us there are 14 servings of lean protein in that batch of cooking. So we take the 28 grams of cooked chicken, divide it by the 14 servings that were present, and that will give us two ounces per serving to get the 18 grams of protein that is recommended in your diet. When considering your lean protein options, you can also consider egg whites and dairy products as part of your lean protein choices. For eggs, the egg white is the only portion that is considered to be a protein. The egg yolk would be classified as a fat. So if you decide to eat an entire egg, the yolk is gonna count for about five grams of fat in that meal. The egg white coming from the actual egg is roughly three grams of protein. If your egg whites are coming from a carton, you need to refer to the nutritional facts on your individual egg white carton because each one is slightly different. 
I have an example here of the egg substitute that's in my refrigerator. Uh, if you look, you see that there are three tablespoons per serving, and in that serving, I get five grams of protein. Referring back to our other slide where we're trying to get 18 grams of protein per meal, I would need roughly three and a half servings of this particular egg substitute to get my needed grams of protein. So I'm going to take my serving size of three tablespoons times three and a half, which gives me 10 and a half or 11 tablespoons because I would round up <laughs> uh, just to get a little bit more food in my diet. But that's how you're going to figure out how much of the egg substitute to put into that meal to get your needed grams of protein. When looking at your dairy products, your dairy products need to be low or no fat, and they can only have a moderate amount of carbs. Low fat means that the fat is about a third of the protein or less. So if the product has 10 grams of protein, it can have three and a half grams of fat or less. With moderate carbs, the carbs need to be half the amount of protein or less. So 10 grams of protein, less than five grams of carbohydrates. Again, an example out of my own refrigerator, I grabbed the carton of cottage cheese. You come over and look at the protein and you see that one serving has 12 grams of protein. So I'm gonna need a serving and a half to hit that 18 grams. But we take that 12 grams of protein, compare it to our fat, just one gram of fat easily falls within the low fat, no fat range. Look over here at the carbohydrates, five grams of carbohydrates to 12 grams of protein. That's less than half. So again, we're falling within that moderate amount of carbohydrates. So I can include this dairy product as one of my protein sources. Let's move on to the vegetable category. Keep in mind, guys, it's really hard to overeat on vegetables to the point that it's going to sabotage your diet. 
veggies in general are very, very low in calories per volume. So that makes them very helpful when trying to control your hunger. So if you find yourself getting hunger or getting more and more hungry as you progress deeper into the weight loss phase, increase your veggies. It's okay. You can increase it to three cups per meal and it's not going to undo all of the hard work that you're trying to, to get through this weight loss process. Uh, on the flip side, if you're massing and you're finding yourself being very, very stuffed at every meal, it's okay to reduce the amount of vegetables that you're eating. You know, only eat a half a cup or one cup per meal so that you don't have quite so much volume to consume. When we're looking at what is a cup of vegetables, it's roughly 45 calories, maybe a little bit more, a little bit less. It's a rough estimate. Uh, again, another rough estimate would be roughly five net carbs. So when you're thinking about net carbs, you want to look at the total amount of carbohydrates in that vegetable minus the fiber. And that value should be less than five. You know, if it's a little bit over, if it's six, it's not the end of the world. Uh, most of your veggies are going to have little to no protein and they should have no fat in them because that's just kind of a common characteristic of vegetables. Healthy fats, this is the delicious column. Okay. When you're looking at what are your healthy fats, you're gonna be wanting fats that are uh, three to one in terms of the amount of fats to the amount of carbs or protein. So if the product has 15 grams of fat in it, it can only have five grams of carbohydrates and five grams of protein. Now, if the protein is a little bit higher it's, it's okay, it's not the end of the world, especially because you guys are all active or athletic individuals. So a couple extra grams of protein in your diet is gonna be put to use. You do wanna pay attention to those carbohydrates, particularly if a lot of your healthy fats are coming from nut butters. Depending on how that nut butter is manufactured, the amount of carbs in it could be very high. So you wanna try and keep that carb amount around one third of the fat amount Hey, you don't want to exceed that because your carbs do need to be monitored a little bit more closely than your protein. The next category that we're going to look at is your healthy carb amounts. Again, this list is very short. There are all kinds of things that you can incorporate into your diet as a healthy carb. When you're trying to figure out, is this particular food product a healthy carbohydrate, you just want to look at the amount of fat and protein that is present. Uh, in general here, we're looking at a five to one ratio of carbohydrates to fat, protein, and fiber. Sometimes the fiber's higher. That's not a big deal. I'm just putting that in there so you know that I do factor in fiber when building your plan. For the amount of fat and protein, if the food product has 15 grams of carbs, it should have three grams of fat or protein or less than that is even better. Okay? So that's what we're looking at. I do not recommend going by net carbs. And I'm gonna go over this in the next couple of slides. Also, I do got, want you guys to take a look at your recommended carb choices. You'll see two hot links below that. One is for a carb calculator, which we're gonna look at a little bit further down in this presentation. The other is just something for your reference. It's a quick guide to carbohydrates where the gram amounts for certain common carbohydrates that you may be consuming has already been figured for you. So it's a really nice reference. I'm not gonna go over it in this presentation, but please click on that, take a look at it. It's just there to help you out and make this process just a bit easier for you. 
Let's look at this example of net carbohydrates and why I do not recommend going by them. I think going by total carbs is much better in terms of having a more accurate calorie consumption throughout the day. Your net carbs is gonna be the total amount of carbohydrates minus fiber. So when we look at this food product here, these Mama Lupe low carb tortillas, we see that the total carbohydrates is seven grams and the fiber amount is four grams. So if you went by net carbs, this particular product would only have three grams of carbohydrates. But you have to think about, there are other nutrients present in this tortilla, right? You can see you got three grams of fat and you got five grams of protein. There are calories associated with both of those macros. So if you only look at the net carbs and say, well, this has got three grams of net carbohydrates, that's only 12 calories. You go to eat this particular tortilla for a meal that only calls for 15 grams of carbohydrates, you eat five of these and you end up consuming 240 excess calories that were not planned into your meal. Something to think about guys, if your goal is to lose a half a pound per week, that's a 500 calorie deficit per day. These tortillas right here just knocked your daily deficit in half. What does that mean for your rate of weight loss? You're not gonna be achieving the goal that you're looking for. So that's why I think it's more important to look at total carbohydrates instead of net carbs. If you are really deep into the weight loss phase and your carbs have been reduced, so you want to go by the net carbohydrates, you can do that, but you have to consider the other nutrients in the food product. So again, looking at the Mama Lupe example, if you only want to count the three carbohydrates, then you need to count the five grams of protein, which is going to account for another 20 calories in this food product, and the three grams of fat. Okay. Uh, by doing that, fat has nine calories per gram, so you're going to end up with 27 calories coming from fat. When you consider all three of the macronutrients present in the food product, you do have an accurate calorie amount. So that means if you want to go by net carbs, you have to count five grams of protein to the lean protein amounts in your meal. So that would come out, out of that 18 grams that we've been referencing throughout this presentation. And you got to count the fat. So whatever fat amount is listed uh, on your individual template, you need to count these tortillas towards it if you want to go by net carbs. As I said, though, I prefer going by total carbohydrates. Makes the math a little bit easier. And, you know, making your diet planning easier is my goal. As I pointed out earlier, Underneath your recommended carbohydrate sources, there is a carb calculator. If you click on that hot link, it's going to take you to a new spreadsheet. At the top of that spreadsheet, there are three cells that you need to enter in information. The first cell is going to uh, come from your individual diet plan, and you're going to enter in how many grams of carbohydrate you're trying to get out of this food product. So let's say that the meal calls for 30 grams of carbohydrates. That's what you'll put in the first cell. The next cell wants to know the amount of food per serving. So you're going to need to look at your nutritional facts and that's going to tell you what number goes there. So I have some rice here that I'm using as an example. We look down and we see that one serving size has 54 grams of uh, dry rice in it. So we put that 54 into the next column. And then the, the final cell is gonna be asking how many grams of carbohydrates there are per serving. So you look a little bit further down on your nutritional facts and you see that one serving of this rice has 40 grams of total carbohydrates in it. That's gonna go in the third cell and then you're gonna get an auto-generated response and you see that for one 30 gram carbohydrate meal, you need to weigh out 40.5 grams of dry rice to make that meal hit your recommended macronutrient needs. 
And you can use this calculator for all kinds of different carbohydrate sources. As I said, nutritiondata.com is a website I, I like to reference a lot when trying to find the nutritional information for various food products. It's a very accurate website and has a huge database of food on it. Last two columns on your diet template are gonna be high GI carbohydrates and workout carbohydrates. Now, some of your plans may not have these two columns. Uh, the high GI carbohydrates are commonly found when someone is training twice a day and needs to quickly replenish their glycogen stores before the next training session. With workout carbohydrates, if your health condition results in any type of insulin resistance or something along those lines, the workout carbs will not be added onto your plan as that is not recommended for individuals with insulin resistance or other um, issues with carbohydrate uptake in the body. But if these two columns are on your plan, what constitutes a high glycemic carb is going to have 50% sugar or more. Okay, remember, we're trying to quickly replenish glycogen stores. Sugar is the most rapidly absorbed carbohydrate, so you want to have a good deal of that in the high GI food. You want to have very low amounts of fat and fiber in that high GI food as those two compounds will slow the rate at which food leaves your stomach, which will slow the rate at which that carbohydrate is able to be absorbed into your bloodstream and transported throughout the body. With your workout carbohydrates, really high in sugar, 80% or more. We're trying to get the sugar or that carbohydrate to your working muscle while you're training so that it can enhance the effects of training and prolong the amount of time until fatigue during that workout session. So no fat, no fiber in those as well, and lots and lots of sugar. All right, now let's take a look at an individual day plan. Again, your plan may differ. This is just kind of a generic plan that I put on here just so I can reference it and talk you guys through it. You'll see that you have gram amounts listed for your lean protein, your healthy fat, and any of the carbohydrates that are included on your plan. This gram amount is for the nutrient listed, not the weight of the actual food. As you saw with the examples that I've shown throughout this presentation, you know, when you're trying to get 18 grams of protein, the actual food is probably going to weigh two ounces, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. Okay? When you're looking at the protein powders listed here, we have whey protein and casein protein. That is the amount of the nutrient. The powder itself will probably weigh a little bit more depending on what else is added in. Okay? And you see we have whey and casein protein. Your protein powders may be a little bit different depending on any health concerns or you know, nutrient allergies, things like that. Um, but in general, whey protein is going to be your intra-workout protein source because it is the most rapidly digesting protein source there is. Again, we're trying to get that nutrient to the muscle while you're training so that you can enhance the effects of training and set the stage for muscle repair and growth when you get done with exercise. At bedtime, casein is the recommended protein source because it is the slowest digesting protein source. Remember, when you sleep is when you have the bulk of muscle repair and growth occurring in the human body. So you want to have a protein that is very slowly digested so that you have a gradual release of amino acids, the building block of protein, released into your bloodstream while you're asleep to facilitate that growth and repair process that's occurring. Okay. And your carbs, your fats and protein, those gram amounts, it's the nutrient not the weight of the food. Flip side, veggies we list in cups simply because you don't need to be so specific with your veggies. You can't really overeat on those to the point where it's going to sabotage your diet, as I said before. So it's just a rough estimate, one to two cups. If you're getting really, really hungry later in the weight loss phase, bump it up, you know, three, four cups, especially if you're eating leafy vegetables. Okay? If you're eating a lot of spinach or lettuce, you know, go to town on that stuff. It's very, very low in calories, not going to have a negative impact on your plan. Let's take a look at the timetable listed on the left hand side of each individual template. 
Your times listed here, there's a little bit of flexibility, but overall you want to try and hit those times as closely as possible. Your first meal of the day should be consumed within an hour of waking. The big important nutrient here is protein. You're coming out of an eight hour fast, maybe longer, uh, and your amino acid stores in your body are pretty much depleted. Okay? You don't really store those amino acids. They circulate in your bloodstream. If they're not needed, they're excreted. So when you first wake up in the morning, the protein amount circulating in your body is very, very low. So you wanna get in a meal with protein in it to get those circulating amounts of amino acids back up where they need to be so that your body is able to do its normal body processes. While training, you wanna take in your, your uh, recommended protein and carbohydrates when you're training. Start sipping on that shake maybe a little bit before you start training throughout the entire training process. Um, try to finish about half to two thirds while you're training and then finish off whatever's left immediately after you get done exercising. That first meal post workout, the sooner you can consume it, the better. Okay? Now, if you, you know, if you miss your anabolic window, it's not the end of the world. There's plenty of research to show that, but it's better, right? You guys were trying to get optimum results. So optimal meal timing is going to be getting that meal into your system within about 45 minutes of finishing exercise. Do the best you can. For that second meal post-workout, you're looking at consuming that meal about two to four hours after exercise. Okay, so, you know, if you are getting ready to go into a meeting and you know it's gonna be a long meeting, maybe eat that post-workout meal, that second post-workout meal before you go in instead of missing that window and waiting until after the meeting. For your other meals, you're looking at about three to five hours between meals. So you have some flexibility there, you know, with the times that are listed on your timetable. For your bedtime meal, that's that casein, that nice slow digesting protein. There may be some fat with that meal. There may be some carbohydrates. Uh, but you want to take in that meal uh, pretty much as close to bedtime as possible. You know, if you're sipping on your casein shake while you're laying in bed, perfect, right? Sip on it, go to sleep, enjoy, you know, the recovery benefits that come from that bedtime meal. Final thing, as you look over your spreadsheet, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, you're going to find a collection of hot links that I have included in your Excel workbook. Um, there's some really useful documents. I'm not going to go through each of them, but I do encourage you to click on each of these and at least scan through, if not thoroughly read, uh, the different documents that I've attached for you. It gives you some more insight and some things to help you out with staying on track with your diet. The useful blogs, I highly, highly recommend reading them. Okay? Um, I think these three little short essays are very beneficial when trying to figure out what's the best thing I can do for myself to maximize this experience um, and you know what is the best way to kind of keep me on track. Here's some great articles to help you on that. Okay, that's it, guys. That's kind of the general overview of these diet templates. I hope this is helping you understand how the process works a little bit better, and I look forward to working with you.